The October 2013 meeting of the EDSAC reconstruction team took place in the Cambridge University Computer Department. And Wilson's then was an incredibly astute politician. Peter Robinson, uh, professor of young, computer technology, spoke of the work of today's computer scientists and of EDSAC um, itself. Young man in a hurry. Um, so he didn't try and do university politics, he just let graduate students, the people who do the actual work in the university, have free access to the Peter EDSAC. Robinson is also one of the EDSAC project machine. trustees. So, uh, to use it, you, um, well, you joined a queue. So in terms of where we are, we've actually... Andrew Herbert revealed that the project is on time and on budget, with an eighth of the replica built and another eighth designed. That means there's seven eighths still to do, but a big chunk of that is these storage generation units. Um, so arguably we're almost a third of the way through. I've been colour coding up the um, diagram of the racks, um, and the basic colour coding is if it's in green, we know what it is and we've built it. Um, if it's in yellow, we know what it is and we know how to build it. And I may be a bit behind the curve on catching up with some of those. Um, if it's orange, um, we think we know what it is and we've got someone thinking about it. Um, if it's white and got a label, we know what it is. No one's currently thinking about it. And if it's white without a label, it's all a bit of a mystery to us. Um, and there's an impressive amount of green and yellow as you go through the machine, um, which is really quite encouraging. This is the result of injecting a single one digit into the system. You see the output of the, this is TTL level, uh, the output of the, the tank is pretty uniform. Nigel Benny continues to unpick the design of the arithmetic unit, or the computer as it was called in the original EDSAC. If you look at the output of the shifter unit, which is the next unit, they're all the same height. If you look at the output of the adder, you get this wonderful modulation. That's about a millisecond. And I have no idea why it's done. <laughs> but he hasn't yet been able to show the accumulator shifting unit working properly. Oh, what a nest of vipers you found. Now, the thing is that... Chris Burton explores we, some of the inevitable frustrations network, in the work, exactly often caused like, by simple uh, mechanical finally, problems. How little did we know uh, when we drew up the chassis and where the metal screening plates fit in and how precise we've made that, that actually the test point connectors which we buy from Rapid Electronics um, to fit into our chassis, which look very good from the outside, in fact, on the inside, they're, they're a pig's ear because they've got... They've not got an insulated body, and they're little bits larger than the originals that Wilkes used. Consequently, we found that the two first two test points were shorting to ch chassis on the screening point, the screening plates, and it makes it quite hard to assemble. Well, we, you know, once more we've found alleviation, but it all takes time and deciding what to do and so on, which is why we've only just got to the point of producing chassis ones. Right, so I'll switch on. John Pratt shows promising results in developing the coincidence unit. This compares two different counters to see if they have the same value before regenerating and sending digit pulses back into the system. If I switch one of the inputs off, like that, that is the not equivalent condition, right? Basically one is different than the other. So that's the pulses coming through and saying we're not the same. If I try and make them the same, I'm left with these, those two noise spikes. Basically. One of the problems has been noise spikes, which he thinks he can eliminate. Now that is now seeing the noise pulse. And you can see the um, flashing unit sometimes triggering, sometimes not. And I have here a slugging capacitor simply by putting that on the reset line. It stops the noise pulse going through. I think that's a fairly convincing demonstration that's on the edge, you might say. So it's that sort of degree of tolerance. That needs revisiting that circuit. Yeah. 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 Initially, I was very nervous about dealing with this sort of stuff, but I know with the high voltage. <laughs> <laughs> Peter Lindington described his work at home on the vital nickel delay lines and reported that while the short delay prototypes are working well, the larger ones need more development work and may be a different material for the steel coils. 
In the lunch break, the team were joined by another EDSAC trustee, Professor Andy Hopper, who's head of the Cambridge Laboratory. The quality of this Marshall's doing it and so on, the, on the repeats will be pretty good, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm quite pleased about that, actually. This is, the, this is the chassis one. That's the store regeneration unit, which is there to ensure that the information in the mercury delay lines is regenerated from the tiny 10 millivolt signals coming from the tank, amplified, gated with clock, reshaped, and, and sent out as a, another 30 volt signal with a 13.5 megahertz carrier out to the going into the tank. Now, we haven't got a tank here. What we've got here is a test set which creates a signal, a 10 millivolt signal, which is comparable with what would have come out of the mercury tank. This has to go into the chassis and is amplified from that 100 millivolt amplitude into 20 volts, which is the signal level we're using here. So we've got a little amplifier at this end, uh, and it's got tuned circuits in it to tune the 13.5 megahertz. The signals out of that, which are displayed on this oscilloscope, there are two pulses that have been made from the little bursts, the 10 millivolt bursts of 13.5 megahertz. Those are then gated with clock pulse so that we get all the signals in synchronism throughout the machine. They're gated with clock. That's done in some circuits here. And then that can be output to anywhere in the computer that needs it. And is also recirculated into this part, which regenerates the signal and puts it into the tank. In addition, incoming signals from the rest of the machine have to go through gates, and those are mixed with the regeneration loop and into the transmitter and into the tank. So we've got here the system which can store information in a tank continuously, can let the information out into the computer, and can accept new information coming in to replace that that's in the tank. It's, it's that, together with the mercury tank, is one storage location which will hold 16 uh, long word, long get back words. Um, and we've got 41 of those in the computer. So quite busy to get a lot of those made, assembled, wired up and working. So that, that's basically what that chassis is for.